If you travelled back in time two and a half thousand years to a random location somewhere in ancient Mesopotamia, and you asked the first person you encountered what they believe regarding the structure of the earth and the cosmos, they may have said that we are on an immovable, flat, circular disc held in place by strong foundations. That due to the curvature of the sky, we know we dwell inside a solid, dome-shaped firmament. Because we can clearly see the sun, moon and the stars, they must exist inside the firmament. The reason the sky is blue and why water descends from above is because there exists a heavenly ocean beyond the firmament. And above those waters, veiled by cloud and majesty, God. While you understand that in this age of scientific illiteracy, people had no means of arriving at current accepted scientific understanding and truth, you decide it would be best to impart wisdom to this man, to provide him with astonishing revelations. You begin by telling him that the earth is not a flat disk, but a sphere. That the sun appears smaller than earth because it's 93 million miles away. But in reality, you could fit 1.3 million Earths within the volume of the Sun. Although Earth appears immovable, it's orbiting the Sun at 67,000 miles per hour. And as we travel around the Sun, Earth spins at 1,000 miles per hour on its 23.5 degree axial tilt. You expect this man to be absolutely gobsmacked to sit at your feet and hang on your every word, like your Jesus providing him with the Sermon on the Mount. But in reality, he runs away as fast as he can because he's convinced that there's something seriously wrong with you. If this ancient concept of the cosmos, as described by this man, was one that pertained to ancient Egypt or ancient Babylon, Christians today would have no issue. But what if this outlook was the accepted worldview of the ancient Israelites? What if the primitive erroneous beliefs of God's chosen people seep their way into the scriptures and are found scattered throughout? Unfortunately for Christians, the claim at 2 Timothy 3 that all scripture is inspired of God, a God that Titus 1 says cannot lie, would be utterly shattered. Believers would be forced to either concede that God allowed these gross inaccuracies regarding cosmology, geology and topography into the Bible, yet argue that the stories, the theology and the God remain true, or they would have to misinterpret and manipulate every single scripture that doesn't align with modern scientific understanding. It's worthwhile to acknowledge that the majority of people who would fall into that second category wouldn't be intentionally out to deceive and mislead others. A view of scriptural inerrancy regarding the Bible is one they may have been indoctrinated to possess from birth. How do I know this? Well, if only a few years ago I called at your door on the ministry, I would have said something like this. In ancient times, the widely accepted opinion was that the earth was flat. Even today, there remains a flat earth society. But notice what the Bible said almost 3,000 years ago. There is one who dwells above the circle of the earth. Now the Hebrew word here translated circle can also be translated sphere. So we have a sphere, but what was earth resting upon according to Bible writers? Was it on the back of four elephants on top of a turtle like some people in history had put forward? Well, notice what the Bible says. He stretches out the northern sky over empty space, suspending the earth upon nothing. To many at the time, this statement would have appeared absolutely absurd. It wasn't until 1687 when Isaac Newton explained that planets are held in orbit of the sun as if hanging upon nothing. And so the question has to be asked, how did these Bible writers almost 3000 years ago know this? Well, the Bible itself says 
that it is the inspired word of God, a God which cannot lie. To someone who is unfamiliar with the entire body of scripture and its ancient cultural context, that presentation might appear pretty damn convincing. However, with hindsight, I look back and realize that as a Jehovah's Witness, I was selectively plucking two verses out of over 31,000 in the Bible and using those as the basis to convince others that the scriptures are in complete alignment with modern accepted science regarding cosmology. When I took the text out of context, I was only giving people a con. You may wonder, how is it possible for someone like myself to do such a 180 degree turn with regards to this topic and what I believe the Bible teaches? What was it that sparked my curiosity that initially led me down the path of investigating whether my Jehovah's Witness presentation was actually correct or not? Well, a few years ago, when I was addressing the major doubts in my faith, I was doing a detailed analysis, an exegesis of the Noah's Ark story and the Genesis flood account. I dissected each and every aspect of the story to see if it stood under scrutiny. Now, if you were to ask many Christians, where did the floodwaters come from? They, just like JW.org, might point you in the direction of Genesis 1 verses 6 and 7, where in the creation narrative, God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. Based on those scriptures, Jehovah's Witnesses, along with many Christian denominations, believe that God created a huge heavenly ocean a suspended canopy outside of Earth's atmosphere. How does that tie in with Noah's Ark? JW.org says that the water suspended above the expanse evidently remained there from the second day of creation until the flood. Any former Jehovah's Witness watching this will know by now that when the organisation uses the term evidently, there is evidently a big problem. They lack any scriptural authority for what they are about to say. Otherwise, they would include the scriptures in brackets after the sentence is finished. They know all too well that in the Genesis account, it does not say anything about this heavenly ocean or this canopy being released to form part or all of the floodwaters. According to Genesis 7, the floodwaters came from the fountains of the great deep and the windows of heaven, and the rain poured down on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. If this heavenly ocean, as outlined in Genesis 1, was released, why didn't God just say so? Why did he use such cryptic, coded language about fountains and windows? A Christian might say, well, Harrison, you really don't need to be Sherlock Holmes here, okay? Genesis 1 clearly states that God created waters under the firmament. It states that God created waters above the firmament. If they didn't come down for the global flood of Genesis, when did they come down? They didn't. And they never will. At least that's according to the Bible. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all shining stars. Praise him, O highest heavens and the waters above the heavens. For he commanded and they were created. He keeps them established forever and ever. He has issued a decree that will not pass away. I searched Jehovah's Witness literature from the year 1930 to today, and they've only commented on this verse once. When asked, what are the waters above the heavens? They respond, the psalmist apparently meant the water carrying clouds above the earth that empty themselves from time to time in the form of rain, which eventually flows back into the oceans. Again, they're guessing. The psalmist apparently meant the clouds. 
Well, if the psalmist apparently meant the clouds, why didn't he use the Hebrew term for clouds? Which, by the way, he did only four verses later. Moreover, this verse isn't talking about the waters just above the earth, like Jehovah's Witnesses are asserting, but waters above the heavens, according to that verse, above the highest heavens. It was at this point where I had a gut feeling that I was being lied to by the organisation. That the image that they were painting with regard to biblical cosmology, geology, topography was vastly different from what Bible writers believed and Bible writers were teaching. And therefore, I expanded the boundaries of my research and it eventually led me in the direction of an image which would completely alter my perception of the entire Bible. When I first saw this image, I imagined that the only people who would put this information and diagram out there would be atheists. And yet the one thrusting this forward as a scripturally substantiated biblical teaching was Christian author and biblical scholar Dr. Michael Heiser. While to me at the time it appeared rather complex and unfamiliar, he broke it down into just three tiers. You had the top tier, the top level, the Shamayim, the heavens above, realm of God and other spirit beings. You had the Eretz, which is the earth beneath the realm of the living, and you had Sheol, which can mean both the grave and the underworld, realm of the dead. But there is one part of this diagram in particular, which ancient Israelites would want you to truly marvel at, a feat of engineering that only almighty Yahweh was capable of. In these verses that we've already read, the Hebrew term rakia is often translated to be firmament. And yet in some translations, such as the New World Translation, it is rendered to be expanse. And so the question becomes, why is the prevailing view among biblical scholars such as Dr. Michael Heiser that this term rakia is descriptive of a solid dome-shaped firmament? Well, it's to do with the verb that the noun is derived from. The noun rakia is derived from the verb raka, meaning to beat out or stamp out. This is often used to describe a lump of metal being beat out or stamped out into thin sheets or a dish. It is the exact same term as used in Exodus 39.3, describing gold plates beaten out into thin sheets. In other parts of the Bible, different terminology is used, but with the same overall impact. When he made firm the skies above, when the fountains of the deep became strong. Here the Hebrew term emetz is used, meaning to harden or to make strong. But if you're still in any doubt, the writer of Job 37 wants to ask you a question. Can you spread out the skies as solid as a metal mirror? The Hebrew word hazak, translated here as solid, is the exact same term used at Ezekiel 3.9 to describe flint rock. If I travelled back in time, the writer of this verse would get me to look up at the heavens and then ask me, can you do that? Can you build that? It wasn't the silly Egyptian god Tar. It wasn't the work of Marduk, the Babylonian god. This was the craftsmanship, the handiwork of Yahweh. And whether I believed him or not, he would want my response to be, wow. Truly incredible. Because to him, it was. Ask yourself this. If the firmament wasn't firm firmament, but soft firmament, how on earth could it hold back the weight of those waters placed above it? Jehovah's Witnesses are left guessing. They say that God's almighty power could easily accomplish it. The Israelites didn't have to guess. They knew exactly how God held back that heavenly ocean. But to me, perhaps the most glaring sign of the geocentric nature of the creation narrative is where God allegedly placed the sun, the moon and the stars. God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. 
and God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also, and God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. A Christian could say, well, okay, hypothetically, let's say you're right. Let's say that the Bible writers believed that there was a solid firmament around the world. That the sun, the moon and stars were located inside that firmament. You can't say, though, that the Bible teaches a flat earth. Well, this is where we need to go back to my Jehovah's Witness presentation and begin breaking that down and dissecting it. Because the first verse I used in that presentation was Isaiah 40, 22. There is one who dwells above the circle of the earth. While the Jehovah's Witness writing department are often big fans of Strong's exhaustive concordance of the Bible, they refrain from using his interpretation, his translation of this Hebrew term chug, which they translate as circle and try and say means actually sphere. That's because Strong's concordance tells us that this term actually means a circuit or a compass. It is the same term used in Job 26.10. He has inscribed a circle on the face of the waters at the boundary between light and darkness. Let's just imagine that I gave you a one pound coin and told you to go shopping and bring me back something in the shape of a circle. And so two hours later you come back and you return me my one pound coin and you say, well, there we go, Harrison, there's a, there's a circle. I might be angered, I might say, well, this is what I wanted. I wanted something spherical, I wanted a ball. You might rightly say, well, why didn't you say? Why didn't you tell me you wanted a ball? I look at Isaiah 40 and I feel the same way. Especially as the writer or writers of Isaiah knew the Hebrew term for ball. Why didn't they use it in chapter 40? Isaiah 22, 18 states, he will hurl you like a ball into a wide land. And this is the problem. We shouldn't be left guessing. This shouldn't be left open to various interpretations. But as to how I arrived at the positive claim that this book does indeed teach a flat earth, we will get to that very shortly. But first, I must tackle the second verse that I used to use in my Jehovah's Witness presentation. A verse which on the face of it appears in alignment with modern science. A verse used more than any other by believers to highlight the apparent divine inspiration of this sacred text. He stretches the northern sky over empty space, suspending the earth upon nothing. In nearly every other translation, the word hangs is used. God hangs the earth upon nothing. Think of any object, a pen, a plate, a t-shirt, a painting. We know which of those are typically hung up. The writer of this verse didn't really have to guess. He could clearly see that the earth wasn't attached or hung up by anything. He could also see that the sun, the moon and the stars weren't attached or hung in place by anything. And so while I'm not saying that there's anything particularly wrong with this verse, I question whether we should be so easily amazed by it. What astounds me is the level at which I, as a Jehovah's Witness, manipulated and misinterpreted this verse to suggest that it's talking about gravity ahead of its time, that the earth is not supported by anything from below, when quite clearly the Bible teaches otherwise. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he hath set the world upon them. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the earth and all its people quake, it is I who hold its pillars firm. Hebrews 3, 4 states that every house is constructed by someone, but the one who constructed all things is God. The Israelites knew 
that a solid building required solid foundations. If God designed the structure of our planet, they knew that it would have the strongest support, the biggest pillars and the most incredible foundations imaginable. But there's one major thing that we know today that of course the ancient Israelites would have been absolutely oblivious to. And that's the fact that Earth is travelling at 67,000 miles per hour as it orbits the Sun. That fact alone stands in stark contrast to multiple claims found in the Bible. He has established the Earth on its foundations. It will not be moved from its place forever and ever. The Earth is firmly established. It cannot be moved. The Earth is firmly established. It cannot be moved. There are, of course, many other facets of ancient Israelite cosmology, from the vault of heaven, the pillars of heaven, to Sheol and the great deep, which I simply don't have time to go into in this video. Not because they're unsubstantiated by scripture, but because I want to get to the real crux of this topic, interpretation and implication. Near the outset, I said that if the Bible was brimming with mistaken ancient Israelite cosmology, some believers would be forced to misinterpret and manipulate the Bible, most of the time unintentionally, not deliberately out to mislead and deceive others. A few years ago, we have seen that that was me. Any verse that wasn't in alignment with modern accepted scientific understanding of the cosmos I would have said was simply figurative, poetic, and had no need to be taken literally. If each of these ping pong balls represent a unique Bible verse describing the cosmos, proponents of biblical inerrancy locate verses which can be interpreted to be in harmony with modern science, label them literal, make them stand out, and then show them off, before labelling every other ball metaphorical poetic, non-literal, and tossing them away. As if by magic, every single biblical verse is in absolute harmony with science, and therefore the scriptures are reinforced as the inspired, infallible word of God. Pretty neat, isn't it? But what would have happened if scientific discovery, scientific understanding, revealed that the earth was a flat circular disk, supported by pillars, encompassed by a solid dome-like firmament. What would my Jehovah's Witness presentation have been like then? Notice what the Bible says. Can you with him spread out the skies as solid as a metal mirror? This was written at a time before any man had ever been to the firmament. Obviously now we know that the firmament is rock hard, it is solid and it protects us on Earth. So that's above Earth. But what about beneath it? Notice what God's word says. He has established the Earth on its foundations. It will not be moved from its place forever and ever. Think about what this writer could see. He could see that the sun, the moon, and the stars all didn't have foundations beneath them, and they moved. And yet, incredibly, this writer put that the earth does have foundations and that it doesn't move in accord with modern science. How did these writers know these things so far ahead of time? Well, the Bible itself says that it is the inspired word of God, a God that cannot lie. When I first realised the scale at which my interpretation of the Bible was off from reality. I remember just sitting at the Kingdom Hall, not listening to a word coming from the platform, and just randomly opening the Bible. And every page was brimming with mistaken ancient views of Israelite cosmology. It all just clicked. The second option I said at the outset with regards to believers being confronted by these inaccuracies is that they concede that God allowed these mistakes, these views of the time into the Bible. 
but argue that the theology, the stories and the descriptions of God are all still true. I couldn't do that. Naturally, I was very suspicious of the rest of the Bible. I didn't trust it. Why should I believe that any of the rest of it is truthful or accurate? For those who haven't been through this sort of process, I could potentially liken it to you asking someone to count out 10 piles of 100 coins. Once they finish counting out the piles, you go over and you look at the first pile and you realise there's only 27 coins. And you ask the person who counted, what's going on? There's 27 coins. And the person says, well, I, th I thought there was 100. But, but don't worry. I'm 100% sure that the other nine piles contain exactly 100 coins. I don't trust you. Using that as the basis to judge the rest of the piles, I have no reason to be confident that you are correct when you say that they are exactly 100. In fact, most likely, they too will be incorrect. Now, I understand, coming from my Christian background, that admitting that even one verse in the Bible is erroneous can almost be like blasphemy. But this is where, if you're a Christian, potentially you need to heed the words of Dr. Michael Heiser. By just letting the Bible be what it is, nothing more, nothing less, even if it hurts, <laughs> right? Even if, even if that leaves you with the feeling that, oh, you know, I, I want it to do something for me here in this argument. But to do that, I need to make it something that it's not, but it'll feel good. I'll win, that. I'll win the point. I'll win the argument. All these concepts and even some of the terms are part of ancient Near Eastern cosmology. In other words, what I'll show you tonight the division of the world, what the world looks like in Israeli cosmology. You'll, you can find the same descriptions anywhere else. Egypt, Mesopotamia, you know, ancient Syria, the Hittites, whatever. Because this was a common worldview. What is it therefore that prevents him from tossing the Bible into the same category of non-inspired writing as every other tablet or text derived from those nations? If we let the Bible be what it is though, we can claim it's unique theologically in what it says about God. But if not, then pagan literature is essentially on the same level. And trust me, you don't want to go there. You want it to be unique. He admits that he wants the Bible to be unique. As a Christian, he needs it to be true. He acknowledges that, yes, the Bible is way off the mark in terms of a modern scientific understanding of cosmology. But that doesn't prevent him from arguing that biblical stories, biblical theology, and the depictions of God contained in the scriptures are all still true. For those who want to adopt that position, there is an inescapable problem. And that is that the stories, the theology, and the depictions of God in this book are all derived from the same authors of the same books as the same erroneous cosmological teachings. Joshua said to Jehovah before Israel, Sun, stand still over Gibeon, and moon over the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still, and the moon did not move until the nation could take vengeance on its enemies. The sun stood still in the middle of the sky and did not hasten to set for about a whole day. We've all been there, right? We're leading an Israelite army on a relentless massacre. And we realise that the number of people we need to kill, that we need to stab and slaughter, far outweighs and is disproportionate to the limited amount of sunlight we have left in that day. So we just put in a casual request for the creator of the universe to make the sun stand still and he gladly obliges. To an Israelite who hears of this momentous occasion, it would be awe-inspiring. Wow, Yahweh did that for you? Incredible, I thought Thursday was long. To us today, it's absurd. It's ridiculous. Not because of the global shift in religiosity, but because we possess 
a greater understanding as to the functions of our solar system and the universe. As you may expect, Christian denominations have come up with all sorts of hypothesis and mental gymnastics as to some way of how this story could be possible. Some people have suggested that at Joshua's request, God immediately clicked his fingers and stopped the earth from rotating. At Johnny Basher via Twitter wants to know what would happen if the earth stopped rotating for a second. Oh yeah, that would be disastrous. Disastrous, because right now, here in New York, you can calculate at our latitude, we are all moving with the Earth at 800 miles an hour due east, because Earth is rotating. If you stopped Earth and you weren't seat belt buckled to the Earth, you would fall over and roll 800 miles an hour due east. It would kill everyone on Earth. People would be flying out of windows, and that would just be a bad day on Earth. I'm just saying. Okay, well... Maybe that didn't happen. Maybe God just gradually slowed down Earth's rotation to a complete stop. Or maybe he just stopped time altogether. Well, maybe you've just produced your own translation of the Bible. And it reads, nothing like any other. Because that is a literal historical account. But there are also visions, dreams, prophecies recorded in the scripture, which all rely on this ancient concept of the cosmos in order for them to even be entertained as a possibility. Behold, a tree in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great, the height thereof reached unto heaven, and the sight thereof to the end of all the earth. A tree visible to the entire world, only possible with a flat earth model. He is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. Jesus being visible with the clouds, only possible with a flat earth model. The devil took him up to an unusually high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. A mountain from which you can see all the kingdoms of the world, only possible with a flat earth model. I'm aware that the apologists would say, these are dreams, these are visions, these are prophecies. You shouldn't be taking them literally. Of course we know that there is no mountain from which you can see all the kingdoms of the world. Don't be so silly. I would ask the apologist, is it silly to you now in the year 2021? Yes. Was it silly to these Bible writers thousands of years ago? No. Perhaps a Christian can admit to themselves that maybe, just maybe, the Bible does contain geocentric flat earth cosmology. But it was of its time. That this incorrect and erroneous outlook of the world and the cosmos made its way and influenced many of the stories contained in the Bible. But the stories were of their time, right? The God, the Creator, He is definitely true. Well, I believe the natural ripple effect of arriving at these conclusions regarding the scriptures shouldn't exclude God. I believe the dominoes fall and they all land at the door of the creator. If we contemplate the Israelites and other nations surrounding them, the Israelites waged war, pillaged, took virgin girls for themselves, offered animal sacrifices, were misogynistic, homophobic, and owned slaves. What of the God of the Old Testament? He was pro-war, pro-pillaging, pro-taking virgin girls for yourself, pro-pro-pro-pro-pro-animal sacrifice. He was misogynistic, homophobic, and he condoned slavery. Is that all just a happy coincidence? Of course, I realise that to many believers, Accepting some things might be incorrect is one thing, but contemplating that your beloved God could be the manufactured image of a bloodthirsty ancient tribe living in ignorance, well, that's something else. Speaking of my own traumatic experience of leaving a high control fundamentalist religion, as much as I desperately desired the Bible through research to be fortified as the inspired infallible word of God, it just isn't. 
To claim that it is, inspired of a God who cannot lie and therefore infallible, is evidently preposterous. We can misinterpret and manipulate the verses as much as we want till we're blue in the face, but there's no way of avoiding them and there's no way of erasing them. And therefore this topic will continue to be one that haunts Christianity by helping to wake members up from their religious indoctrination.